Today's episode is based on a very true fact, despite all the urges not to read the comments. If you consistently reply with one phrase, if you consistently email us one phrase, if you argue with us in the comments, by us, I mean mostly me, in the comments, eventually we'll have to do an episode on a topic. That topic is General Smedley Butler. You may have heard his name in reference to a really great episode we did around the war in Afghanistan with uh, General Dan Bolger, actually our biggest ever episode of all time. Yeah, it's great, great episode. People were bringing up an idea of War is a Racket, which is based off of a pamphlet that Smedley Butler wrote as a post-retirement Marine Corps general in the 1930s, which is based on the idea that will resonate with a lot of you that effectively war, corruption, profiteering drove a lot of really bad decisions in U.S. foreign policy history and draw a lot of decisions today. People are bringing up War is a Racket in the context of the war in Afghanistan. Now, while... Sorry, I'll let you speak to this in a second, but I think while we're both sympathetic to critiques of the war in Iraq, critiques of the war in Afghanistan, as the author of this book, Gangsters of Capitalism, Smedley Butler, The Marines, and the Making and Breaking of America's Empire, will point out, Smedley Butler's thought is a little simple, it's a little oversimplified, and it's a little misused. So it's useful to have a really interesting author come on to talk about it and its themes. Yeah, I, you know, that's what I loved about Jonathan is that. He even was willing to say, look, yeah, like Smedley's analysis was not 100% on. It's kind of taken a life of its own in the year 2022. Here's what the context of what he was actually saying was, which is actually very useful. And by the way, not enough people actually do know about a lot of these wars, about the deployments to China of the Boxer Rebellion, around U.S. deployments in Haiti. They may not even know what the USS Maine is or the U.S. occupation of the Philippines. There's a convenient reason why we don't talk about this because it was not a great time um, in U.S. history, but it's still important. And to use that as the heuristic from where Smedley Butler was coming from, then reckon with the legacy of his idea of his book and more, I think is very useful. So I think people will enjoy uh, and get a lot out of this, especially in the context of any current modern event where we're arguing for war or not. Um, and I think you'll enjoy it. And look, the, the real thing here is like we obviously have people who are critical of our coverage of an issue like China. And I think it's really important that we have guests like Jonathan on. Like Jonathan is like, he kind of like implies that the US wasn't the good guy in the Civil War, um, which was like an interesting take. So yeah, I, that was, have, I was wondering what he said. I didn't press him on that. I was yeah, yeah. Like, but what, like, look, what? like we're gonna have like we're gonna have like people who are on the left yeah. um yeah. who are gonna agree with us on this topic. And I also make clear that we are definitely the only China Hawks who will have a conversation about racism in Haiti and the Philippines during the 1920s. So it's 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 good that we could do that. It's actually a very important um episode we we'll do that. Um also want to call out um Jonathan has a really interesting um, podcast that we are putting out in the blog. It's tied to his actual newsletter. His book is going over all these different like cultural artifacts. So what he's doing is he's interviewing guests and talking about these various points of U.S. history through the lens of a cultural artifact. So he does an episode on Guantanamo Bay with Spencer Ackerman, who came on this podcast last August to talk about the war on terror through the lens of uh, Harold and Kumar escape from Guantanamo Bay, a very specific artifact of 2000s culture, which almost certainly is not aged well. So I definitely want to go yes. check that out. A lot of great stuff here. Now, quick things. We're going to do the round up everything you need to check out, have been loving the tipping function, not just from a sense of like, hey, it's cool to get a bit of uh, monetization on the podcast after waiting two and a half years, but also just the fact that it's cool when people send it when they actually like the episode. So if you like this episode, if you like the YouTube video, if you liked a newsletter, send us a tip. It is a cool feature and it just kind of gamifies us trying to put out the best content we can here as we scale up this year too. Substack is coming out on Thursday. So definitely go check that out as well too. You can subscribe in the link. Finally, Bookshop. This is a book show a lot of the time. So Gangsters of Capitalism is available there. Definitely go check it out. Lincoln Network, thank you for supporting our work. Let's get into the episode. Jonathan Katz, welcome to The Realignment. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, good to see you, John. Good to see you. We do a lot of book episodes, everybody. And I have to say that for a book about a historical topic slash figure, Jonathan does a really excellent job of unironically melding the 
past with the present day dynamics. Sometimes you'll read a history book and there'll be an implication or a subtle hint that something that's happening in the 1890s relates to today, but you actually do a great job of counterimposing the in-person and the past. So I hope during our interview we could capture that because it's actually what made the book really, really enjoyable on my end. It doesn't always happen when you're reviewing a book, but let's just start here with why we really wanted to speak with you. Listeners to our episodes around the um, withdrawal from Kabul and Afghanistan really heard us talk a bit about this idea of war as a racket, an idea which I think is a really interesting idea, but it's actually one I disagree with. But in, in the name of all good faith, I'd love to have you, Jonathan, explain war as a racket, the idea, the pamphlet within the context of Smedley Butler, the Marine who your book focuses on. Sure. Um, so, yeah, so... Smedley Butler, as you note, was a Marine. Uh, he joined the Marine Corps in 1898 to fight against Spain and Cuba. Um, and then he basically served in every U.S. invasion, occupation, uh, conquest that happened from 1898 until really the, uh, his retirement in 1931. And then he spent the last 10 years of his life um, basically campaigning against war, against imperialism, um, and as you note, in 1935, he wrote, uh, he actually kind of summarized the speech that he had been giving, uh, called War as a Racket. Um, and then he followed that up with, with a, a several a, a series of articles um, that are sometimes mistaken as having been from War as a Racket, um, but were actually much more sort of uh, confessional and, and critical of himself. And in War as a Racket, he is essentially, and, and that period of his life, he's essentially making the argument that, uh, and it's, 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 it's not a very subtle argument, and it is, it's also not like a very, it's not a scholarly argument. Like he, he was a Marine, uh, he didn't go to college, and, and he's, you know, he's, he's talking in, in, a, in a popular argument to, to, you know, the masses. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the argument that he's making is basically two parts. Um, the, the the first part, and, and, and this is really what's com- contained in, in the book, War is a Racket, um, is that there's essentially what ends up uh, being dubbed by uh, Dwight Eisenhower speechwriters a couple decades later as the military industrial complex. So essentially, his argument is that you have industries, uh, especially the arms industry, especially the munitions industry, in, in, in his telling, who uh, kind of force the United States into wars, convince politicians to back wars, uh, to invade other countries um, in order to boost their bottom line. Um, in in the, the next part of that argument that he was making in these articles, he wrote them primarily in, in a magazine called Common Sense. Um, he was saying, and he was, he was basically borrowing a metaphor from prohibition. Um, he had spent a couple of years, he had taken uh, two years of leave of absence from the Marine Corps actually to run uh, the, the police department in the city of Philadelphia, which was his hometown. And he had been fighting against the racketeers, against the, the, the mob, uh, the bootleggers. And he's taking that metaphor and he's saying that you've got, you know, you've got the big bosses, you've got, you know, the brain guys. Um, you've got the finger men who are telling, you know, uh, uh, where to attack. And then you've got the soldiers. And he was saying, I was a soldier. Um, and he makes this, this, uh, uh, famous confession where he talks about, you know, all the things that he had done to Latin America, to Asia, to China, um, and says, I was, I was a racketeer. I was a racketeer for capitalism. And what I love about the way you sum that up. And I immediately started thinking about is my critique of Butler is he confuses or his popular model is conflating two very different types of wars and the dynamics in them. So as you're mm-hmm. discussing here, the wars, and we'll go into these specific wars you're talking about and you travel through these small, not in, not in human terms, not in moral terms, but small interventions, mm-hmm. gunboat diplomacy, invasions of Haiti, interventions in the Philippines, the Boxer Rebellion. Those type of wars, and you really chart, are wars where often you do see moneyed interests Mm -hmm. um, engaged and involved. My objection is, and why I think in the 1930s, his ideology, despite the fact that he was an anti-fascist person, ended up unhelpfully framing 
so for example, I put it this way. I think the argument that war is a racket ended up creating a false vision of why World War One happened, which ended up enabling I the worst version of isolationism in the 1930s. Mm-hmm. So it's one thing to say, hey, like a sugar plantation or a sugar interest has an interest in Latin American interventions. And it's another thing to say, hey, like let's not engage in Europe in the 1930s because this big bad arms industry forced us into World War One. So can you like reflect on that part a bit? Is that a is that a fair I think segmentation of those two parts of the argument. I mean, to a certain extent, I'm, 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 so I'm partially, partially, I'm trying to answer this, song for, you know, as, as myself, and I'm also trying to sort of exp- explain how Smedley Butler looked at that question because those are two, those are two different things. Um, I, I think that, so, you know, as you say, um, it was, it was, it was this. It, Butler was making a very simplistic argument. Um, and, he, and he was making an argument from the perspective of somebody who had been, you know, a frontline soldier in all of these wars. Um, and, you know, he was, he was, he was somebody who had joined the Marines at the age of 16 during a huge propaganda run up to war against the Spanish and what's often known as the Spanish American war or the Spanish Cuban American war or the Spanish Cuban Filipino American war, depending yeah. on who you're asking. Um, and, uh, you know, and he felt he he felt that he had been to a certain extent duped. Maybe maybe he even would have acknowledged that he was willingly duped. Um, but he felt that he had had gone to war to defend democracy, to in his words, free little Cuba. Um, you know, and the Spanish were doing horrible things in Cuba. They invented concentration camps there. They were they were you know killing civilians. And he felt that he had gone to war to you know defend a democracy against an empire and then ended up just sort of, you know, creating an empire. And I think that, you know, his answer to that question is that it can be very hard to tell mm-hmm. which kind of war you're in um, until you're in it. And really until you look at it in retrospect. So world war two is a big deal. <laughs> I don't know how to put it other than that. Like, and, and it, and it, it occupies so much of our imagination, you know, the imagination of everybody who's lived, who lived through it and everybody since when we think of war, you know, that's oftentimes the war that we think of. And there's a, there's a new book out um, uh, called, you know, in, I believe it's called in search of the good war, um, which is sort of about the, the, the propaganda surrounding world war II and, and after the fact, you know, trying to make sense of this like horrible event that, we were in, right? And World War II is a very complicated war. Um, it's a little too simplistic to say, you know, that we just went to war to, it's, in fact, it's way too simplistic to say, we just went to war to fight fascism in Europe. That would have been a great reason for a war. I would have, I'd be totally into that, right? The, what, what, Butler, what Butler was arguing about in the 1930s was he saw this coming confrontation, not so much with Europe, not so much with Nazi Germany and Italy, um, but with Japan. Um, because he had spent, you know, the, the, all the things that he was doing were really, to a certain extent, based around the Pacific and the United mm-hmm. States control of and and colonization of the Pacific. Um, Even the things that were happening in Latin America, even the things that were happening in the Caribbean, a lot of that had to do with the Panama Canal. Uh, Butler was part of the Marines that essentially helped sever the state of Panama from Colombia for the purpose of building the canal and then protecting the sea lanes to the Panama Canal. All of this was, you know, to... uh, the colonization of the Philippines and all of it was ultimately to, you know, expand U.S. markets into China, um, where Butler also invaded twice uh, as 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 a Marine, first as a as a junior officer and then as a general in, in the 1920s. And he saw he, he, you know, in China both times, um, he was essentially allied with uh, Japan and and the European powers, and it, particularly in the 1920s. He saw this coming confrontation with Japan. He saw that, you know, the United States is an empire. The Japanese are an empire. We're both grabbing land. We're both grabbing possessions in the Pacific. And that this was going to create a great power struggle 
over the, the, the control of China, over the control of the Philippines, uh, over Hawaii. And, and, uh, and he saw, you know, this is going to drag us into a war. And he has, uh, you know, a, 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 a phrase that he uses um, in uh, some of the things that he's writing uh, after Wars Iraq, like in, in like 38, 39, where he says, you know, we'll be dragged into a war before we know what it's about. And I think that, you know, again, I'm not a Japanese imperial apologist. I'm not trying to say like, I'm not trying to say that like Japan good, United States bad. That's not that's not at all the argument that I'm making. But 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 I am saying that, you know, and 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 maybe this is like you know other than that, and this is Lincoln sort of of argument. But taking Nazi Germany out of out of the war and looking at what actually does get us into World War II, right? Because, because Japan attacks Pearl Harbor and on that same day attacks the U.S. colony in uh, the Philippines, attacks the U.S. colony in Guam, attacks the British colonies in Malaya and, and Singapore. And, and it, it's, it's that conflict. That conflict looks a lot more like World War I. That conflict becomes much more sort of two, two great powers for you know venal and also self-protective but not necessarily like ideological reasons uh uh, going to going into a a bloody struggle with one another and the last thing i would say about that is you know i think that so butler did not identify with um you know the america firsters in in the late uh 1930s and especially well the early 1940s because he died in 1940 um you know he was not on he was not on the team of uh charles lindbergh uh or you know uh, father coughlin Mm -hmm. um he uh you know and 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 one of the things that's hard to say is what he would have done if he had lived even a couple years longer because he dies the same day the French signed the terms of surrender with the Germans wow. uh, in, in 1940, and then 18 months before Pearl Harbor. And all of his children go fight in the war. A, a destroyer is named for Butler, and it participates in uh, both the invasions of Sicily and D-Day. Um, and then ultimately, maybe ironically, a, a, a uh, Marine base camp uh, is named for Butler on the island of Okinawa uh, mm-hmm. after the war. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't know what he would have thought. Uh, I do know that 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 uh, Smedley's wife, Ethel Butler, uh, Bunny, as he called her, um, she's actually approached by, um, you know, like a like a peace committee, like essentially, you know, a, a committee that's trying to keep the United States from 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 getting involved in in the war. Um, and they want to they want to run an excerpt of War is a Racket. And Ethel says, no, she says hmm. like she says, like, we're, we're at war right now. She's basically like, call me when the war is over and then maybe we'll try to, like, you know, prevent the next one. Um, so I don't know. I mean, my 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 guess is if he had been alive uh, uh, when when Pearl Harbor happened, he died pretty young. He died at, at fifty eight. That you know he he may have reenlisted at that point. That's um, fascinating, but, but, we, yeah. but, but it's really hard to say. That's a very interesting uh, kind of history. You know, talking about it from the Japanese perspective is very useful too. The best professor I had in graduate school, I actually did national security at Georgetown, which was you know interesting for a variety of reasons. But uh, he made us and challenged us to think about World War II and the beginnings from the Japanese perspective. He's like, look, they see what is happening in Cuba. They see what's happening in the Philippines, uh, you know, in the early 1900s. They see uh, become an industrial power by copying the West. It makes sense to copy the Western military strategy. And then um, amix the, you know, run for the empires and all of that, the Germans and everybody collapses the uh, which leaves you a lot of territory, and then the U.S. just cuts off your oil supply, which is an existential threat. Right. So he's like, "Well, you know, from that perspective, bombing and preemptive war kind of makes sense." I'd never thought about it that way, and it was very yeah. interesting. Um, in order to at least try and do so, he actually forced us to write an entire essay for that. It's always stuck with me ever since. So, what do you think there about what Smedley Butler got right? what he got wrong, and his legacy kind of in our politics today of the year 2022. 
That's really quick. Good questions. Um, what did he get right? I think so. You know, he his his ultimate answer is that, was that war is bad. Mm-hmm. Um, sorry, I'm 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 I may be freezing a little bit, but um, uh, you know, his his ultimate answer was that you know don't do war, <laughs> and that war is not and and war is and that war is not noble necessarily, right? And that that war is not you know simply saying you know, I am going, uh, you know, just to serve my country does not necessarily mean that you are serving the interests of most people in your country. Yes. Um, and, and you are off and you are doing that at, you know, often at the, the cost of, uh, of the people in the countries that you're invading. Um, you know, I, 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 uh, I, I think I, it's, it's clear. Um, I, I, I think I make the argument explicitly at some point, or at least implicitly, um, that you know the, the the wars of the early 21st century, uh, like Afghanistan, like Iraq, like you know Syria and Somalia and Libya and and all of the the the, the forever wars that you know in in many cases are actually still happening, um, really resemble much more. The wars that Butler fought in the early 20th century um, than than anything else, and that really yeah. one of the things that you know <clears throat> that really comes out when you study this, and that really was made clear to me in in you know when I was doing research for gangsters, um, was that like it's really those are really the kinds of wars that the United States has historically fought, um, you know, sort of big, you know, good versus evil conflicts um, like. World War II in Europe for sure, um, and uh, you know uh, maybe maybe some people will disagree with me on this, but I think like you know the Civil War ended up being you know you know I don't right know if the United cause. States was good in that, but like the Confederacy right. was definitely evil, so so there was that. Um, uh, but you know most 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 of our wars are much messier, grosser affairs, and you know he realized it way too late. I mean he he. You know, I think, and I think this 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 comes across in the book. Like he, he was he was an ass. Like he did he did he did some horrible things to a lot of people, um, and and his fellow Marines uh, did so as well. And he wasn't necessarily speaking out. He wasn't really speaking out against them at the time. Um, it's only sort of at the end when he goes on these speaking tours and he's trying to, you know, frankly, he's kind of grifting, like he's trying to make money to like, you know, pay for his house uh, you know, in the middle of the great depression. And he goes in these speaking tours and he's, he's really sort of, I think I, I may even say this in the book, like he's basically like a poster, right? Like, cause he realizes that like going on the speaking tour and, and saying like the most uh, attention getting thing that you can then gets you more invitations to give more talks. And it's only in doing that, that he really realizes how little Americans know about mm. what's being done in their name. Um, and, and so it's, you know, I, I think that's, you know, I think that's good. And, and having, and having done those things is bad. I think that, you know, more broadly, um, you know, he has a lot of blind spots. Uh, race is, is a big one. Um, he, you know, he is, uh, less racist than some of his fellow, you know, just overtly white supremacist Marines, um, which is not necessarily saying much. Um, you know, he, his, his mentor, uh, for, for, you know, most of his time in the core, um, is a guy named Littleton Waller, Littleton Waller, Tazewell Waller of the Waller and Tazewell families of Virginia, um, who, whose, whose family had among other things, uh, his, his, his ancestor, uh, was the enslaver of Toby Waller, who Alex Haley identifies in roots as Kunta Kinte. Wow, um, wow. like these were like, these were, yeah. These were, you know, and 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 Waller's living that. I mean, he's just out there being like, let's just kill these N words. Like, mm-hmm. and Butler, and Butler is like a little subtler, although not much. Um, and uh, and and, and in, in some ways, you know, he ends up being more destructive because his ability to, just, you know, for instance, see black people in Haiti as people then leads him to, you know, more effective methods of control. Um, but he's he's really he's really blinded to that. Um, he, you know, his, he, he develops a sort of class analysis later in his life, but, but it's not very, it's not very subtle. Um, and it's not, it's, it's not, it's not very well thought out. It's just sort of like all of this is being done, you know, the, the elites, they're just, you know, taking advantage of us. Um, and it just, it, it just, you know, leaves out 
the agency of, you know, people in the working and middle classes who, you know, who go along with these things and, and sometimes, you know, lead them because, you know, for whatever reason, they, they agree with them or they think they're good for them. So I think he got, I think, you know, he had a lot of blind spots. Um, he got a lot of things wrong, but, you know, and, and by the way, I mean, I would say, um, you know, going back to like your original point, mm-hmm. you know, when, when, when people say, you know, read war is a racket, it will teach you everything you need to know. I'm, I'm kind of like, yeah. Not, yeah. not really. This yeah. is basically, <laughs> this is all I needed you to say okay. to feel good. Cause my, cause this is why this started mm. looking at the war. There is, and we'll get into the war in Afghanistan, but yeah. war is a racket basically explains nothing causal about the war in Afghanistan. And that is my problem. Um, cause the, the cause it's, I, I like the way you framed it and, and, and Sagar, you set this up with what is the lesson from Smedley Butler? The lesson I'm taking here mm-hmm. is wow. Like wars of territorial acquisition and imperialism are bad. Mm-hmm. This idea that countries should take other countries land and make it their land is bad. That is not a good thing. Um, it's very important to note here. There's a reason why most people don't know the history of U.S. intervention in a country like the Philippines. Not merely because it's not covered in history, because it's it's unsuccessful. It, it's it it only lasts for forty five years. Um, well, I mean, and, that's pretty successful in its own right. And, but yes. but in the in the sense that in the sense, but what I more mean here is that mm. the the American attempted empire is just a total catastrophic failure by the standard of thinking like, hey, like the the British were able to maintain an empire for hundreds of years. Like I think Mm -hmm. something you really capture what's interesting here and the race factor is interesting because like to be be very clear here, like this isn't just, because we have like a 50-50 split audience here. This isn't just like us scoring woke points. Um, The Filipinos, they 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 had representation in, in in Congress, um, in, there there was like there there was a dele- there, there there are delegates. They weren't voting they didn't delegates. Have, they, they they didn't have voting. I mean, they, yeah, I but, think but, but my point is, they were that. T- that's that's the, all. I'm, all I'm saying is, they were that tied into the U.S. And, and what I basically mean is, the reason why they never become a new state is is just like literally because of racism. Yes. Um, that's like the, so that's what I'm really getting at here. Like the reason why America isn't actually able to integrate this thing into itself is like actual, like literal racism. Yeah, we're, we're, we're too, we were too, I mean, this is just, it's just true. And you can just go through the congressional record in the debates that are happening and, you know, look at the insular cases, uh, which is, is the nickname for the series of of rulings by the Supreme court that basically decided that um, Filipinos, Puerto Ricans, I mean, it's, there's those, those rulings are still uh, in effect today in Puerto Rico, in Guam, um, uh, you know, the, in the Virgin Islands, in the Northern Marianas Islands, um, where, you know, basically they just decided like, we're too racist. Like they, they, they will, these, these, like these people will just never be white. They'll never understand Anglo-Saxon principles. And so they just don't deserve, um, self-government. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, um, it's really, it's really shocking. I mean, I, I you know, like, uh, uh, you know, you talk about, um, uh, you know, people in Congress at that time, uh, like one, one of just like the all time assholes in American history is a guy named uh, Ben Tillman, Pitchfork Ben. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a, he was a, a one eyed. Uh, th- that's not what made it evil, but it just sort of adds to the, <laughs> it just adds to the character. Um, he uh, he he you know, he was he was a, he, he had he had joined the Confederacy um, he was, and, and remained sort of a, like a, an unreconstructed, literally a neo-Confederate um, who played a, a leading role in um, in uh, 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 drafting the Jim Crow Constitution in South Carolina, bragged on the Senate floor, um, uh, basically about like the, the, the you know the the the, uh, the disenfranchisement of of black people, the the, the denial of education, um, and and oversaw like a huge you know wave of lynchings as governor of, of South Carolina, and then he's in Congress while this decision is being made to annex the Philippines. And he's saying like, no, if we annex the Philippines, if we make it a state, then all of these non-white people, and he lists them all like in like, just like the most you know racist terms that you could get away with on the Senate floor in, in I guess, 1899. Um, and he's just like, like, you know, all, we can't do that. Then all these Filipinos will come here, and it, and it ends up sort of being a compromise between people who are too, are so racist that they're not even willing to like annex the Philippines, and like you know the Teddy Roosevelt 
crew um, who are also like white people are the best and white people should inherit the world. Um, but it's our duty to like teach these people by killing them. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the benefits of civilization is essentially like the compromise between, between those factions uh, that, that ends up, uh, that ends up, you know, creating the, the insular acts and, and this sort of weird, you know, uh, the, uh, the, one of the ways it's often put is out, that, you know, yeah. <laughs> but one of the ways it's often put is that uh, the constitution does not necessarily follow the flag. Um, and, and, and here's the question, yeah. which I always want to get to whenever we recount America's sordid history in these areas. Mm -hmm. What do we do with this now? So, you cover China. We talk about China. Um, it's in the book. You know, you're you're looking at the um, Boxer Rebellion, and you know, like literally dividing China up. Mm -hmm. When when the CCP looks at their relationship to the world today, mm -hmm. they look back at that century of humiliation and say, "Hey, look, that was the worst thing ever." You 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 go into the fact that very prominent names in American history. Um, Forbes Carey, mm -hmm. um, Delano Roosevelt are descended from families that literally um, spread opium. It's, it's, it's as if the you know leading families in China in 2100 were the people who literally like made all of their riches off of um, the opioid epidemic in terms yeah. of like sheer death and destruction. Like that would be yeah. the proper metaphor here. But at the same time, the CCP abuses this history to say, hey, all these bad things happened. Therefore, we're going to take over Taiwan. And you can't say no. So, right. so my question basically is how how can we have this be a useful conversation? So, how do we how do we acknowledge history, but then also recognize that the three of us, a like I'm um, like a black Jew, like Sagar is like a like Indian second generation immigrant. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to guess like your background, but like we weren't responsible on several different levels for mm -hmm. any of these decisions. So I don't feel as if I should be constrained in how I look at a question like Taiwan or Hong Kong by my metaphorical ancestors' poor choices. So how do you think of this dynamic? So yeah, you're 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 asking a lot there. Um, yeah. I would say um, a couple of things. First of all, uh, and China is a great example. They they do they use this history. They use it in their propaganda. Um, you know, I spent a month in China uh, uh, reporting this book and, and spent, you know, a lot, a, a much more time than that, you know, researching this history and the ways the, the history is used. Um, and, and they use it. And when, when, when they are talking about the United States um, in 2022, the, the assumption of their, the, that they're using and the, the assumption that they know that their audience in China is, is bringing to the table are these memories uh, of and cultivated memories of these humiliations and these abuses. And, you know, so the first thing is, uh, you know, and I, I say this in the book, not even knowing the history just seeds the conversation to, you know, the worst malefactors, um, you know, like, like these things happened, they happened. I, I, you know, my, 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 you know, I read my book. It's got, you know, I forget. It's like 50 pages of like, of, of footnotes or of end notes, which was severely reduced at the insistence of my publisher from like the actual uh, length of that thing. Um, it is, it is, you know, I, I can, I, I back everything up. I'm not like, I'm not, none of this is hearsay uh, it, 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 except for where I'm like, you know, quoting a source and I'm like, mm -hmm. then you can look back at that original source and, 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 and figure it out yourself. Um, but you know, these things happened and, 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 you know, Americans were in, in many cases bragging about them at the time and not knowing them just makes it so we can't even participate in the conversation. It puts us at, at, at you know, I mean, just to you know, put a, a nationalist spin on it, it puts us at a disadvantage. Um, in the Philippines, where I also spent time, uh, uh, you know, researching the book and there's, you know, two chapters about China and three chapters about the Philippines in there, Rodrigo Duterte, um, the, 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 the authoritarian president of the Philippines, you, he uses the, the U S history of, uh, uh, exploitation and war and, you know, sort of in, in some concentration camps, torture, uh, you know, in, in some cases, sort of low level genocide in the Philippines as a way to reposition himself away from the United States and toward China. Um, again, you know, and a key thing, cause we yeah. haven't discussed the Philippines before, Rodrigo, like sometimes I realize there's debates around illiberalism and liberalism and all of this. Like Rodrigo Duterte is a bad dude. 
Yes. Like, th- th- like this, this isn't merely like this isn't just like a this isn't even really an ideological debate when it comes to assessing whether or not this is a person who should be respected on the international stage. Like he brags about like killing people. Um, you want to talk like drug war? Like there's like insane like extrajudicial like yeah. literal murders of literal drugs. So I just want to like make make a clear like editorial point. Um, yeah, when for I was there, when, when I was there, um, and it's still going on. But but I was there, you know, during the the, the so called what what is officially or not is what's known as the war on drugs um but is really it's really a a war in which uh the state and sort of allied you know gangs um are you know killing the poor um and just and just murdering people and just leaving their bodies in the slums um and there were there were you know these things called uh, I, I worked with a, a fixer a, you know filipino journalist who, who sort of acted as a translator and and you know Help me figure out where to go because I'd never been to the Philippines before and I didn't speak any of the hundred or so languages that are speak, spoken in the Philippines, literally hundred, I think. Um, and, you know, uh, she, she would talk about, uh, you know, the night shift uh, where, you know, they would get called out to a quote crime scene, which was inevitably a place where the police had killed somebody um, and then, you know, and then set it up and been like, who knows who did this? And then like, you know, we're basically saying to journalists, like, you know, who did this? We did this, like, be afraid of us. Yeah. And, and Duterte, you know, he uses that for his own power and the, and, and, and the Chinese government uses that for their own power. So, so one thing that I would say is that like, you know, knowledge is power. Like if you, like not even knowing, not even knowing these things happened, like, how, like what, where does that leave you? Like how, how do, how do you even then participate in the conversation? Um, you just look dumb and, and you, and you don't even, and you don't even know where people are coming from. Right. So that's, that's one thing. The other thing is, um, you know, like in terms of my background, um, you know, I, my, uh, at, at, at the moment that most of these things were happening, you know, my family was in Russia, um, you know, being pogromed out, uh, they, you know, they were, they were, uh, you know, uh, uh, emigrating to uh, the United States, um, you know, essentially as, you know, refugees from, from anti-Semitism and political violence and, uh, and, and economic violence. Um, and so, yeah, like I don't have, you know, I don't have any, you know, I don't have any ancestors who were, you know, in the no, Marines. No, no with Butler. <laughs> your yeah. college tuition wasn't covered by what happened here is what you're it, describing. Exactly. But, but I am an American, right. And, uh, and, and I, and, you know, I live here now and I benefit from, you know, I benefit in many cases from the things that were either set up in that time or the things that came out of that time. Right. I mean, you know, so much like, you know, this is a, another place where, you know, Butler gets it right. He doesn't get it right. Like in, in, in like the subtlest way. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, he, he understands that, you know, these things were done for profit um, you know, to a certain extent, profiting the elites, but also like it just it just brought lucre. It just brought you know cheap commodities to America. I mean, you know, in uh, you know in the banana wars as they were known, which Butler fought in, like those were about uh, first of all bananas, which were not widely available in the United States before that, um, and 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 they just sort of you know allowed. Uh, you know, big companies like uh, what's now, you know, Chiquita International, then United Fruit, um, to just sort of open up, you know, big plantations where, you know, peasant workers were harvesting bananas and selling them here. He he invade, he he's in, uh, participates in the invasion of Mexico in 1914, which was done at the behest of the oil companies. I mean, literally, William F. Buckley Sr., the lawyer for the oil companies, Right, you know, writes the the Wilson administration and is like, there's a revolution going on in Mexico. We need a U.S. invasion in order to protect Texaco um, and Standard Oil. And, and you know, quick and, thing for the audience here: yeah. the William F. Buckley references to William F. Buckley Jr., who is effectively the father, the fa- the intellectual father of the modern conservative. Wow, American history is a very small club. Very small <laughs> that, club. That's the takeaway from this. Conversation. And you're and you're not in it as as, <laughs> as George Carlin always. <laughs> So then, Jonathan, yeah, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go, uh, I'm just thinking, it's fascinating. Mm-hmm. As you said about the legacy of Smedley, he was right, but he also gave a heuristic which is a bit too simplistic um, for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And as this is what Marshall alluded to, you could say war is a racket, 
and people would assume that that's the reason we invaded Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not. You could say that that's the reason we stayed in Afghanistan for so long. Um, but those are two different arguments. Mm-hmm. So what frustrates you most about the deploying of war as a racket in contemporary political conversation? So, okay. So war as a racket itself. I, I, I actually, I don't spend a ton of time on it in gangsters. I, 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 I and makes it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, but I did spend a, you know, a fair, it's not a long book. So I spent a fair mm-hmm. amount of time, you know, going through it and, and actually sort of like did um, with a researcher kind of did like our own kind of fact check on it. Um, you know, I include one error, uh, just glaring error in, 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 in my book uh, that's in war as a racket. You know, he, he makes a statement that like, you know, uh, prohibiting uh, war U S warships from traveling more than 200 miles off the U S coast would have prevented the, the USS Maine from going to Havana in, in 1898, uh, which is, immediately disproven by the fact that Havana is 90 miles from, from US, right. the U S yeah. so like that yeah. doesn't work um, more broadly, you know, he's, he's made, you know, he makes this argument. There was an argument. He wasn't the only one making it at the time um, that essentially, you know, the munitions industry had, had, you know, gotten us into world war one. And uh, there was actually a congressional committee that was formed um, independently. I mean, this was just sort of in this was in the zeitgeist at the moment, uh, called the Nye Commission, um, which investigated that issue. And they basically they basically found, I think, sort of the answer to what's also going on in in or what has been going on in Afghanistan was once war was declared, they made a ton of money and they made sure that they were making a ton of money and they made sure to like, be like, Hey, don't you need this weapon system? And don't you need this kind of gun? And don't you need these undershirts? And, and they were, and they were, you know, they, they were grifting off. They were, they were profiteering off of it. Um, but the, but the essentially that, you know, it, that, that, that saying that, um, you know, DuPont or, or Remington or, uh, you know, or, 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 or whatever general electric, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that they went to, you know, uh, uh, Will Joe Wilson and were like, you know, we need to invade Europe. Like that, 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 that's not what happened. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it is, so, so this is why, you know, this is why I, you know, it's, it's, it's subtler than that, as you know. Um, and, you know, there's there are all what Butler gets wrong or what he gets what he sees a little too simplistically is just how complex these situations are. How how many different how many different mouths there are to feed? How many different voices there are? Um, you know, I mean, the invasion of Iraq, like alone, there was so many. You know, there was there was there were people who were like, we need this to spread democracy. We need this because Saddam Hussein is a bad guy. Saddam Hussein was a bad guy. That was just true. Um, you know, there were people who were like, you know, uh, we need to we need to get in for the oil. Um, mm-hmm. there, are, there are other people who are like, oh, it's too vulgar to say we need to get in for the oil. It, 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 you know, it's anytime you try to boil down something as complicated as a war even as, 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 as complicated as an individual person like Smedley Butler in, into a, into a, you know, a single explanation, you're always going to trip over yourself. And so, you know, I guess, that, you know, the, the, you know, I understand and, and endorse to a certain extent, you know, first of all, people should read, you know, war is a racket. Um, they should also read gangsters of capitalism because I think I do, I try to, give more i try to give more complicated answers to to, mm-hmm. to why these things happen and and other sources right um you know but but you know that that's not that you know it's that is not a book that on its own will will explain everything but the military industrial complex is a thing and it is a powerful thing and it does explain a lot it doesn't explain everything but explains a lot um, I was, you know, I was the, the correspondent in Haiti during the, the, the 2010 earthquake. And I, I covered, you know, the, the international response, um, which ended up being, you know, just a complete disaster cluster. Yeah. Right. right. And, uh, uh, you know, and, you know, some people were involved in that to make money. Some of those people were Haitian. Some of the, many of those people were, you know, the so-called beltway bandits. 
um, you know, the, 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 you know, the for-profit, uh, you know, uh, contractors, uh, uh, you know, DynCorp, uh, Chemonix, um, you know, who, who were, you know, pushing their own, but none of them caused the earthquake, um, you know, so it's, 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 and, and, and none of them were, were solely responsible for, for what happened. I, I just think, uh, you know, what, what I want is, 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 uh, you know, for people to, and this is what I tried to do in, in writing this book. I'm trying to I'm trying to explain it from multiple points of view. Smedley Butler's point of view, like you know, the historical consensus point of view, you know, historical revisionist point of view, the points of views of of different groups in all of these countries. And in and in doing that, like I'm trying to hopefully like you know create a more 3D, really 4D picture because I'm also moving through time. Yeah, this is a very useful heuristic that I just, you know, want to emphasize of what you're saying, which is that they're more like vultures than people who are pushing something. And even if they are pushing it, they're not generally the main impetus, but it's mm. more like once you get involved, once the meat is on the street, you know, so to speak, mm. then they just come swooping down and um and and creating that system. So, I guess what I'm curious is mm. is that, you know, when we see this um, and the, there's so much lack of faith, I think rightfully, in the foreign policy establishment um, and more. What do you think is a good heuristic for people to have um, and thinking about this multifaceted confluence of events if a future kind of conflict arises? What are the people, things that people should ask themselves and the reference materials that they should have? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, um, you know, to a certain extent, it's, you know, look, if in 2002, I remember 2002 very well, I was a senior mm. in college. Um, uh, and then I ended up actually reporting from the Pentagon at the, at the outbreak of, of uh, the Iraq war as I was a grad student at the time, but I was also reporting for, for a small newspaper chain called Lee Newspapers. Um, and, you know, if, if, if more of this history had been part of the conversation, I think, some, you know, who knows, but maybe some different choices could have been made, right? I mean, people who just could have been like, you know, you're saying this is for democracy. You're saying this is for freedom. You're saying this has something to do with 9-11, which it doesn't. Um, you're saying they're ma weapons of mass destruction, which seems a little suspect. Um, uh, you know, how, you know, what if we look at this in the, in the lens of, you know, these earlier wars, not just, you know, because mm -hmm. again, all anybody can ever think about is World War II. If they if they if they want a war, then they then they're just like you know uh, Saddam Hussein is Hitler, um, and and you know and 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 not invading will will you know be Munich, um, and uh, you know you know and to a certain extent you know because it's it's more in living memory Vietnam, and so that was sort of it was just sort of like is this World War II or is it Vietnam, and it was mm -hmm. like. It was it was more Vietnam than World War II, but it was really more it, like like Iraq really had much more in common with you know the 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 uh, it, the invasion of Haiti in 1915, um, you know the, the the invasions of of Nicaragua in in 1910 1912, um, uh, you know. Well, actually, looking you could even start where you begin and say that Iraq literally had something in common with uh, remember Cuba. the Maine yeah, because you have this exactly. incident exactly um, unlike. With the main, except September 11th was real <laughs> in terms of the, the, right. the, the underlying dynamic there. Yes. Um, yeah. But then that leads to, for, for example, like if you're yep. you're talking at the start of the book about you know how you know Smedley Butler, he's in he's in you know Phil, he's in Pennsylvania, he's on the main line, and they're all talking about this war and mm -hmm. you to avenge this act. None of them were thinking, hey, like what happens if it turns out the Spaniards have this terrible turn of the 1850s fleet that will right. defeat in a day with basically actually this is I, I think I this is really morbid, but I always think of like the worst deaths in a war and the only casualty of that battle was a guy who died of heat stroke um mm -hmm. on the american side just like one like one specific guy died of heat stroke but the point is you had no idea that invading cuba would then lead to a 46 year occupation of the country right no one thought hey getting osama bin laden or attempting to get him in afghanistan would lead to kabul 
yep. six months ago. So I, I think that's just like the, I, I want, I want to add. Uh, no, that, that, that yeah, you, you bring up, you, you bring up a really good point. Um, you know, Butler, it, it's, it's, it's the main um, that really, you know, that he looks back on as, as being, you know, one of the things that gets him into that war, even that, I mean, like, again, you can just drill in forever, even, you know, even the main incident, sorry, I'm, I'm freezing a little bit. Even the main incident, um, you know, it gets oversimplified. It, you know, it, mm-hmm. it seems like, you know, by all accounts, um, the main was probably, it was probably, it probably wasn't like literally a false flag. It was probably just like a terrible accident. Terrible yeah, it was accident. a big accident. Yeah, exactly. It, the ship was just poorly made. Like the, the basically, like the munitions were next to the boiler. It was a dumb idea, and um, uh, you know, and there were other things also that that led to you know the the, the main blows up in February. War is declared in April, um, and and the push to war had had already been going on. You know, to a certain extent, it was propaganda, but it was it was you know pushed by the war lobby, pushed by Cuban exiles. But but about legitimate things, you know, the Spanish did they had they had just invented concentration camps in Cuba. They were doing horrible things. And so, you know, Americans were like, you know, like Spain is bad. And, you know, a hundred you know, whatever it was, in yeah, Cuba. <laughs> yeah. And like 200, you know, whatever it was, 262, um, you know, sailors and Marines really did die on the main. And then it just gets, you know, caught up into this war fervor. And, you know, 9-11 is sort of similar, like 9-11 an absolutely atrocious, horrible tragedy that ends up being used by the Bush administration to its benefit, which does not then logically lead to the Bush administration did 9-11, but you can sort at all, but you can understand how people would come to that wrong conclusion because like, if they hadn't had a 9-11, it's almost like, well, they would have had to do something like that because it ended, they ended up using it for their own benefit. And so, yeah. And so, you know, that, that, that's, that's the kind of thing that I'm saying is it's like, you know, look at history, like look at the ways in which tragedies get used for certain purposes. And, and then look at, you know, look at all of the times that, um, uh, you know, people have said, you know, oh, uh, this will be an easy war. We'll be home by Christmas. Um, you know, just set up your pic- picnic blanket and 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 watch it start. Like it's not going to be a big deal. And then twenty years later, uh, you know, and and however many you know thousands or or millions of dead there are, um, you're like, well, we should have seen this coming. Well, you could have seen it coming if you if you looked at how this well, had happened before. And you're helping me better cement. And once again, it's like not because a, a we'll, we'll hit this in the intro. Where we're talking about Smedley Butler because he was the most decorated Marine. In U.S. history, he was a yeah. you know senatorial candidate. He was this was like a very this is a deeply important person in a period of our history that we just don't really focus on for a variety. Like the let's just say the industrialization stuff was a little more interesting in terms of history book stuff. Mm-hmm. So I'm concerned about his lack. And I did this terrible thing as a reviewer of a book where I read the first 75 pages and the last 50 pages. So maybe I missed something right in the middle. But I'm concerned with his lack of interest in the role of ideas mm. in war. So for example, you said it yourself, Munich, appeasement. Mm-hmm. My interpretation of post-World War II history, and I say this is someone who's cribbing from other people, this, this is not my original idea, right. but let me just put it this way. The idea of leaders not wanting to be Neville Chamberlain, of mm. believing that giving in in X, Y, and Z situation leads to Hitler rising, has caused more wars than any under-the-counter check from an industrialist ever, um, and you know, like, like, and that's a serious. That, that has nothing to do with money. It, it's it's an, it's an actual idea, an idea yeah. that if never Chamberlain had stood up to Hitler in 1938, the world would be a better place. Right. Like you said, this is the problem of treating World War II as everything. Then all of a sudden, um, and I think Korea is a little more complicated, but Vietnam is all of a sudden World War II. Um, talking of bombing Iran in the 2000s of World War II. Um, Iraq is World War II. And, that, and that's a real problem. So I, I, And right now, like right now, the, the, those, those drums are beating in, in Ukraine. Um, you know, people are, people are talking about, you know, Putin and Russia. And mm. you know, what like, do you think it, about Putin and Russia? Again, not a good guy, not a good country. Um, I don't, re- I really do not, I, I am terrified of a war. Um, I think that, I think that, you know, going to war in, I don't know what we do, 
but, but going to war in Ukraine, um, you know, could easily lead to World War Three, um, and and that would be very bad. Um, and this to, is this is my thing, though. This is this is what I want the audience to really get. Like, we and, any, and anyone and anyone that, who's like anyone who's like you know, oh, it'll be quick. And but but this is but this is the thing though. Like, I don't think anyone. No, I I don't. There is no one. And this is why, like why it's important to have this conversation after twenty years of Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. No one is arguing for good or for ill that this will be quick. Right. Um, and I also think I, I like the I like the emotional way you describe that war because because this is this is what frustrates me when like the audience writes in with the more conspiratorial direction where mm. where it's like actually someone saying that Putin is Hitler that's a that's such a powerful idea mm -hmm. you saying hey actually this isn't Hitler we don't want Vietnam we don't want twenty like th those are just really powerful ideas and I, I just let me just ask this quick before I give Sagar the last question, yeah. which is what, what 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 was Smedley's viewpoint just on like ideology, like so not as domestic politics, which were mm -hmm. kind of progressive Republican. -y. Like what what how did he think about this type of question? Um, I mean, so in the same way that you know, thought since World War II has been influenced almost entirely by World War II, especially you know in the, the 1920s and 1930s everything was viewed in, in terms of World War I. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Neville Chamberlain as well. I mean, what Neville Chamberlain was trying to do was he was like, there was this, you know, this just meat grinder that just wiped out a generation in every European country, including the UK. And he was just like, I don't want to do that again. And that was why he was greeted, you know, when he came home from the Munich conference. As a hero. <laughs> as a hero. Because, because Britons were like, you know, let's not do that again. Um, you know, it is, sorry, it is, um, you know, and, and, and Butler as well. I mean, Butler, um, so Butler goes to, he's, he's in World War I. Um, he, he, he gets there sort of late. Um, he's, he's stuck in Haiti. They, 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 the, um, uh, the Wilson administration considers him too important to the occupation of Haiti. Um, but in 1918, uh, he goes to France um, and gets his first general star um, and is in charge of a basically a dis disembarkation reembarkation camp in Brest on the on the you know the far far west coast of, of France. And so he sees you know the the, the soldiers uh, getting off the boat and then he sees the soldiers, far fewer of them and less of them individually because they're horribly maimed. they're you know they're blinded, they have these like gas injuries and he sees them coming back the other way. And so what he's what he's doing in the 1930s is, you know, he hates Hitler. He calls him a mad dog. He gets court-martialed in 1931 this for insul insulting Benito Mussolini. Like, Can you tell a story he, real quick? It's, it's very funny. It's, it's, a, it's a funny yeah. story. Uh, he gives a speech at, a, you know, a club in, in Philadelphia where he recounts a story that he had heard um, uh, from a friend that uh, the friend was driving through the countryside uh, with Mussolini in his Fiat and uh, that basically Mussolini runs over a child. And that was uh, the funny part to be clear. The, the funny part. The <laughs> and, 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 and the, the American friend says to Mussolini, like, you know, uh, <laughs> I think we hit something back there, something like that. And, and, uh, as Butler recounts it, he says something along the lines of like, you know, what is the life of a child in, in the history of, of a great state? Um, Butler, to his credit, and this is me as a journalist giving him full credit, he does not burn his source. Uh, his, source his source turns out to be Cornelius Vanderbilt IV, um, <laughs> who is not, by the way, the last uh, journalist in the Vanderbilt uh, family. Uh, uh, Anderson Cooper, Anderson probably Cooper. the yeah, most, most prominent right. of those. Um, and, and Vanderbilt sort of uh, some other reporters figure this out. They 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 track him down. He denies it at the time, but then in his memoirs is like, okay, yeah, all, all of that happened, which is um, crazy. Like <laughs> the United States had good relations. The, the United States was trying to maintain neutrality, and yeah. and 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 had good relations with with Mussolini. Like you know, people are you like, saying active duty generals shouldn't be giving paid speeches where they have an incentive to troll and get clickbait. Cause that's the, like, that's like just a quick sidebar here. Yes. The thing that's also wild is that if, yes. this is the book where if you served, like Sagan, I have interest in like defense policy, but if, mm -hmm. if you've like served in the military and you hear how crazy things used to be, he's not, he's a, uh, 
doesn't have a college degree. He becomes an officer. Mm-hmm. He's even these speeches or movies. It was it was kind of like, man, like sometimes norms are just good. Like it's a, it's a it's just like a very cold take, but man, like yeah. we need rules. One thing, <laughs> well, it's one funny because yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. One thing. One what the, yeah. the, the the funny uh, uh, footnote to that is that um, to to represent him in the court martial, uh, Butler asks his friend Henry Leonard, um, who has one arm. Uh, because they had fought together in in China during the Boxer Rebellion, um, and and his friend Harry had had rescued Butler after Butler got shot and got shot in the arm and ended up losing the arm. The reason why Leonard and Butler both got shot was because they were led into the Battle of Tianjin by a doughy uh, engineer named Herbert Hoover, who at the time of this court martial happens to be president of the United States. So Butler gets his friend who lost his arm because Herbert Hoover screwed up and took them to the wrong place on the battlefield to defend him against the Hoover administration and gets him off. Um, And most importantly, uh, makes it so Butler does not have to apologize to Mussolini. And Butler had a big point there. His point was, you know, this goes back to, to what we were talking about earlier about, you know, fascism and, 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 and Butler and, and, you know, politics in the 1930s. Butler's point in telling that story, he doesn't tell it just sort of as like a, like a, like a shocking story. Mussolini at that time is trying to position himself as kind of a reasonable moderate. He's trying to say like, he's trying to say like, we just don't want another war and we should all disarm at the same time that, you know, he's clearly like, he's about to invade uh, Ethiopia, (laughs) Ethiopia. Exactly. And Butler is saying correctly, like, you can't trust this guy. Like fascists are killers. They're duplicitous. They'll say anything. Um, Don't, don't believe him. And 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 saying that as an active duty officer is is what ends up getting him court martialed, yeah. and, and then and then he and then he ends up getting off. The best thing that ever happened for Norms is when Truman fired Douglas MacArthur. Um, but Jonathan, unfortunately, I have to run to a meeting. I've yeah. really uh, enjoyed talking to you, and the book has been is fascinating. I think this is very useful to people. Uh, whenever you hear people bring up War as a Racket, most of the time I haven't read it. Uh, they've just. Uh, they like the term and like to throw it around. So this is, uh, I think, a very, very good analytical framework, your book, um, and this episode in particular. So we'll have a link down there in the description, and we appreciate you joining us, man. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks for coming.